um, nice to be here. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm a talker too, so um, I, I, I too can talk for days. Um, and I too absolutely believe in doing things with people. I, you know, I, I love the internet because it's two-way traffic. I'm not very good I, I, in my sort of soul at broadcast, and yet I broadcast all the time. So if you, if I go too fast, if it doesn't make sense, if it's boring, shout back at me. If you want to ask a question, don't wait to the end. Just interrupt me. Yep. So um, this is a, a bridge that we have further down river. This, this dock here is actually the river. Um, this is the Clifton Suspension Bridge on an on a extraordinary foggy morning. Um, but it's just bridges, I think, are terribly symbolic sort of structures. I, I like bridges. Um, but really, it's, for me, it's about how different areas of our experience, different areas of our learning, you know, have been chopped up and how actually they're in this digital age completely recombining. And it's very much about, for me, it's all about people. Um, and it's all about how the, the new technology that is the internet is both enabling and creating lots of disruption. And what do we do with that disruption? Is it a positive or a negative? Because I'm not very good at hierarchies and structures, I think it's a massive positive. But you know, unless we keep disrupting, it will settle down. And the internet does have massive potential for broadcast as well as for network. Um, and because everybody can and does use the internet, it does mean that the marketing buck can work really, really hard on the internet. So it's really important that we all engage. Um, so, you know, very much, we really don't know what's coming next. You know, great comment I just heard at the end of um, the last talk. If you start with Twitter in year one, will it be there by the time um, people graduate? And even more, what's happening that we don't know about? What's already coming? Um, but the bit that stays the same is us. We are analog beings. For all that, you know, we love the internet and we use it all the time. And, you know, again, I'll actually reinforce that. It just gets more complicated rather than it gets simpler. We still like coming together. We still like to see each other, touch each other, share a conversation. We are social beings. And I think that's so powerful. And it's that very sociability that, that helps us constantly step forward. And I think that's particularly relevant in the creative industries. Um, this shot here is at the top of the hill um, behind us. Um, this is the City Museum. And a few years ago, the director of the museum allowed Banksy, you've all heard of Banksy? Yeah. Um, to take over the museum, and I literally mean take over the museum. Um, this was his poster, this upturned ice cream cornet with dog turd, um, and he called the exhibition Banksy versus the museum. So it was set up as an oppositional construct, and yet it was done with such love. So the ground floor, he'd stripped out the exhibits, and they were there was a Banksy exhibition, which is odd in itself because his whole art form is gorilla on a wall. Suddenly it was all placed in a museum. That was a bit odd. But it's an old-fashioned museum, 19th century museum, lots of floors and rooms. As you went round that museum, you suddenly, ah, oh, is that the Banksy? And he'd intervened in glass cabinets of um, Chinese um, uh, ceramics. And you just find one, you know, no label on it, just so everybody was going around the museum trying to spot the Banksy interventions. He recurated the museum. He took everybody around the museum and actually expressed his love of that museum and talked a lot about how, as a youngster growing up in the city, it was going to the museum that he got his, his, his inspiration, his ideas, his reference points. And, of course, when he started... I mean, he was uh, a person to be arrested. <laughs> People are selling their houses for a fortune because what they used to try and paint over is, is now very much a valuable asset. So interesting how quickly things can change. Um, in the UK, lots and lots of stats starting to come out that the creative economy is increasingly important. 
it's true the world over, but you know, this is really being pushed hard in the UK. Bristol has a particularly strong creative economy, so it's even more important for, for Bristol. Um, lots of reports have come out recently just saying, you know, Bristol really is a, a place that has high density, not just of creative, but of tech as well. So we have a heritage that um, back in the 1970s, Labour government then, they launched um, a, a series of programmes that they talked about the white heat of technology. And one of the big investments was a chip design and manufacture uh, company to rival the American, you know, in Moss and that. Um, and the design facility was established in Bristol. Now, it didn't work. Usual sort of big government invent you know, intervention. It was public money. They got it wrong. But what it did do was bring a lot of high-tech um, electronics engineers to Bristol. So we now have the biggest silicon chip design cluster in the world after California. None of thing is made here. It's all white label stuff. But there is some in, in, in this device that you've all got in your pocket, says on the back, designed in California, made in China. There's at least six, 16 components inside this that are made in Bristol, that are designed in Bristol. So, and what's happened over the last couple of decades is there's, because Bristol's a relatively compact place, there's been a lot of interplay between the tech people and the creative people. And so as digital emerged, it's a really fused community, which has allowed a lot of competitive advantage. So even Aardman, who you know, are absolutely world famous for their model animation, more than half of their output is now CGI. They still do do some stop motion, but most, most of the ads and that are, are, are CGI. Now, they take the time to make the CGI look like it was handmade, so they'll put thumbprints in the, in the CGI to make it look like um, it was handmade, but it's not. So the, the two infect each other all the time. And you know, I'm sure you've all seen this quote from Steve Jobs, but I think it really does capture this, this fusing of things. You know, if we went back to 2000, Apple were basically a niche computer manufacturer that was probably going to go bankrupt. They're now the biggest company in the world. And it was that bringing together of really elegant design, great technology, but content. And you know, it's actually that fusing of, of creative and tech that has transformed Apple. And there's somebody working a way that's going to knock Apple off their perch. But that, that combination of, of, of things. Um, last year, there was a big report done in the UK about the importance of clusters, of physical clusters. And it identified 12 clusters in the UK that were high growth and globally significant. So in London, financial sector. Um, aerospace was, was, is a sector. Um, but one of the 12 was this high-tech and ICT, um, which was a diverse combination of electronics manufacturers, animation, and computer graphics. They, the, the researchers actually said, we do not understand what is going on here. This does not fit any of our conventional industrial sector modeling, but something's going on. We've got to rethink it. And I think that's where the real strength has come. That you know, it does this. This cluster does go from Toshiba to Ardman's, and they talk to each other and work together. And the other thing that really makes this happen, um, so we're we're just here on the water, and this is just a few of the brands. I mean, this is all close walking distance. So that you know, physical proximity allied to uh, digital connectivity has created a very diverse cluster where small startups can talk to big people. Someone like Vince can, can emerge and feel not isolated. And, and that connecting people and creating space for new and quirky ideas it is really, really important, I feel, as we move forward. And there's been a whole raft of reports on a national level and international level looking at this combination of arts, creative industries, and, and tech. And a, a British, um, London-based 
uh, thinker, Charlie Ledbetter, I think is one of the people that's been right on the money with this. He's been in a long series of um, uh, uh, pieces, uh, books, um, lectures around the whole notion of we, that you know, the, the world is all about we today. It's all about doing things together. It's all about collaboration. Um, and there's an increasing body of evidence emerging in the UK that um, the arts are a really, really important part of the innovation system. Almost the arts are part of the R&D system of the commercial creative industries. And that's really where we've placed Watershed. We very much seek to be an active connector. An awful lot of the work that happens in this building, that is exhibited in this building, that tours out from this building, that is published from this building, is not programmed by us. We're just part of an ecosystem. Um, we see our job as trying to encourage new voices into that ecosystem. We see our job as connecting people up, believing that the more connectivity and the more energy there is in the system, the stronger the system will be, the bigger the economy will be for everyone, and therefore our slice of it will get better. So we've, we've had a number of studies of the way we work, and um, some anthropologists said that our system was a classic gift economy. Um, so we try not to make every transaction about money. Of course, money needs to come into it, because if we're not earning money, we can't keep you nice and warm and uh, host talks like this and have toilets and lunch. But if we try not to have every transaction driven first and foremost by money. It's, you know, it's about a value transaction in which money is part rather than the core part of it. And so it's very much about joining up across people who are different. We talk a lot about new ideas coming from crowding diversity. So whether it's a student with an established lecturer, whether it's an anthropologist with a computer scientist, whether it's a startup company with a major multinational, whether it's someone from Africa working with someone from Norway, you know, just chuck difference in the space and somehow a question will come up that makes you think differently. And we increasingly try to focus on what are the interesting questions, because it's usually interesting questions that get you to move forward. We're, we're fortunate, we don't have to be too worried about answers, other people can have answers, we'll just keep asking questions. And so the space that you're, you're in now has come out of that practice that we increasingly began to understand that you, physical presence was a major factor in this connected internet space. Um, it, it, it grounded things, it, it gave you differentiation, that what the internet allowed us to do was connect with a lot more people a lot more regularly, but those connections only had real meaning if people had come together and shared a project, shared some time, they made something happen, or they tried to make something happen and failed, and then learned. So the whole ethos of this space is a collab collaboration space. And nobody pays to be here. I mean, nobody pays to use this space. The, the space is funded by a, par a, a partnership between ourselves, University of Bristol, and University of West of England. We pay the overheads. And then people um, either bring a project to us, we might advertise a commission, we might get some money from elsewhere, it might be a research project, as, as this one is. Um, but the whole idea is, you, because you haven't paid cash to use the space, you, however, pay by contributing your knowledge to the community. So the deal is anyone that's here is interruptible. So if I've got a problem with my project, I can go and ask you to help me if I think you've got skills that I don't have. So the whole idea is we curate a real mix of skills and different projects in, in, in the community so that there's always someone who can help you, believing also that you can then ask them for help. So it, it makes things move much more quickly. The people you need are on your doorstep to help with your project. And then the other thing you have to do is share your learning. So every Friday, there's a talk at lunchtime that's open to everybody where somebody shares what, what they're doing and what they're learning so that we have community learning in a very natural way. From that comes research projects, companies spin out new ideas, and people go, so this is an idea and talent incubator. It's not a business incubator. Once you've got your business, 
there are plenty of places that will do that. We're, we're about trying to encourage the ideas. This is a, a less glamorous bit of town. This is a, 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 um, a street called Stokescroft, which is just off the centre of the city. It's, it's a sort of symbolic meeting point of the city. So on um, the side behind me, where this picture is taken from, is a hill that leads up to the nice terraces and the more expensive, predominantly white areas, white middle class areas of the city. Behind this is the traditional um, area to which um, African Caribbean people came, St Paul's. It's now much more of a diaspora. But this street, you know, became very decayed, but became a real meeting point of the city. And it was sort of really that meeting point that came up with the Bristol Sound 20 years ago. It was all about this melding of different cultures, different traditions. It's now a really, really lively street, but it's becoming gentrified. It is going to change. And the real action is sort of moved over that way a bit toward, towards Eastern is pretty cool these days. But, you know, any city is in, is in motion. Um, but this building still remains completely undeveloped. Uh, you know, a developer is holding on to it until he gets maximum value for it. And it's been, you know, taken over. This is my bit of graffiti just put in here. I think the key thing for, for any of us, whether we're in the arts world or the commercial world, we've got to be relevant to someone. And authenticity really, really matters. I think increasingly, you know, people are not interested in the marketing message. They're interested in what does it mean? You know, what, what, what is the value? Who are those people? What's my relationship with them? But this quote at the top from Geoffrey Crossick, I don't know whether people know him, but, you know, very well-respected academic in the UK, create spaces in which something can happen. And I think that's the big mantra that I try to live by. Now, whether those spaces are physical, intellectual, whatever, it's how do we create the space? How do we create the permission? How do we create the confidence to take risks, to do things, to encourage each other, to learn from when we get it wrong? Um, and quite often, getting it wrong is just, it's the wrong time. You come back 10 years later, and that old idea will work. Um, so this is an attempt at our business model. Um, any of these logic models are complicated. Um, but the real, the real attempt at this is, I, I don't know how many of you have been you know, at a business school lecture or wherever, and they talk about your logic model. They tend to be linear. You put something in this end, you mince it up, you put a skin on it, and it comes out the other end as a sausage. Um, and I, I just don't think the creative economy is linear at all. We're constantly reworking things, and we're doing it you know, in, at different levels all the time. So this is sort of trying to say that you know, we do things internally. We're quite a tight group. We, as often as we can, stick them out into a wider real world and see what happens. And then every now and then, something really works, and you know, it's out in the world. So uh, the creative director of Watershed is currently out in Tokyo. We're launching one of our programs, Playable City, in, in Tokyo this week. Um, so it's, it's this whole I idea of understanding, you know, when an idea is very, very delicate, you, you really have got to be careful of the space that it's in. But don't overprotect it, because if you don't put it in the hands of people who you're hoping are going to use it, who haven't been party to the idea, you're never going to find out if it's got real traction. You know, I always love the story um, of text. You know, that wh when, when the mobile phone companies came up with text, it was going to be a business tool. And there was a lovely advert in this country, B very smart business meeting, all in sharp suits. And one of them is texting to the other one under the table, some killer message to make the meeting work. And of course, it didn't take off as a business application. What happened? The kids got hold of it, because it was cheap. Um, and, and suddenly, text is a major medium. Um, and I think that, that whole thing about you just don't know what any new affordance, whether it's tech or freedom, is going to do in terms of the way people behave. So actually testing things in the real world, in real time, is vital. Actually doing it with people. But so our logic model is all about relationships. It's all about permission. And we talk a lot about permission to play. I think everyone understands play. 
you know, they often think it's for kids, but it's great. You know, it's a great way of reducing us all to a, a space where suddenly the conventional rules are off and certainly the metrics are off. Crowding diversity, trust is essential in the space. Trusting that you've got some interest in me, that's only going to happen if I've got some interest in you. Um, we've got a creative tech development program. We work an awful lot with young people. We do lots of stuff. Thank you.